Good afternoon and welcome to this, the Lancashire's Innovation History Session of the Lancashire Innovation Festival. My name is Richard Slater, I'm the publisher of Lancashire Business View magazine and I am joined today by two of the greats of the Lancashire creative community. <laughs> With me are Ed Matthews Gentle and Tony Attoid. And I think the first thing I'd like to do is to let them introduce themselves rather than me mess it up. So first of all, Ed, tell us who you are and what you do. Hi Richard, I'm Ed Matthews Gentle and I'm the um, programme lead for Creative Lancashire, which is a service provided by Lancashire County Council, where I'm also the strategic lead for culture and creative industries. And who does Creative Lancashire support and help and what are your outcomes? We work with the creative industry sector more broadly, so that's all of the subsectors, including screen and film and music, um, design agencies, all of the creative disciplines. And our remit really is to develop and help grow the creative sector in, in, in the county and develop those key partnerships so that opportunities that are available to help invest and grow the sector here are available to those organisations who want to um, be based in Lancashire. And, and, and in just in its broader sense, before we move on, the, the creative sector, how does that feed into generally into our economic sector and into our business sector? Well, creative industries is one of the key growth sectors for the UK. It's growing faster than any other economy, twice the rate of any other economy actually in, 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 the, in the UK. And creative industry skills drives every sector. Um, and increasingly so, in, in the future, jobs in manufacturing, engineering are going to be as much about how they incorporate and how they appropriate the skills of a creative to deliver products and services. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's Ed Matthews Gentle. If you'd like to tap your teacup with a little teaspoon or whatever way you want to celebrate the welcoming of Ed to this event, please do that. And please also save some of those taps on the teacup for my next guest, <laughs> who is Mr. Tony Attard. Tony, could you introduce yourself perhaps from your business perspective and also from your public facing perspective as well. Uh, yes, thank you Richard. Um, my name is Tony Attard as Richard said and uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Panaz Group uh, which is, um, I mean I started life as a designer which led me into creating Panaz uh, which is one of the foremost textile companies uh, in Europe, manufacturing uh, fabrics for the hospitality sector, the healthcare sector, and also the commercial uh, sector. Um, and uh, we're responsible for a lot of innovations. Um, and um, innovations, I would say, is probably part of our DNA, because it means that we be, we're very competitive in the world. Um, we export to 60 countries, so it's uh, absolutely essential that we're innovative. Uh, I'm also chairman of Elucid, which is um, a startup spin out from the University of Central Lancashire, uh, which is really gathering momentum now in the field of uh, waste recycling uh, and the production of beautiful products from that waste. Uh, I'm also chairman of Marketing Lancashire, um, which in turn uh, I'm, I'm chairman of uh, Lancashire's um, City of Culture bid for 2025. So that's, that's just a few to go on with. Well, thanks. Now, now, this session is designed as Lancashire's innovation history, and we are going to get to that. We've got some nice, interesting uh, points that Tony has researched for us. But I think before we get to that, and I'm not really after strict definition of the phrase here, but Ed, what do you mean by innovation? Well, that's a question. I mean, it's easier to kind of to see what, what innovation looks like than to say what it is. If you were to speak to an organisation say like, like Design Council, they talk about the double diamond and the convergence and divergent thinking. But I think, for me, innovation is, is really about the, the approach and the methodology to, um, to an idea or to a, a product or service. It's about finding a gap and identifying something that didn't exist before. And there is this um, intrinsic connection between creativity and innovation. For me, the two are... They're not the same, but not one and the same, but they are, have to both exist together for, for me to have real true innovation. Thanks. And, and, and Tony, whether in business or whether in public service, how do you conceive the idea of innovation? It's about thinking differently, Richard. Um, it's a, it's a, I mean, in, in, terms of, in terms of business, uh, we harness innovation throughout the business in a very professional manner. Um, we have innovation meetings. We talk about driving those innovations through the business because there's no point in coming up with a great idea unless you actually have the infrastructure within the organization to take it to fruition. One of the things that's been levied 
um, at, uh, as a criticism for British industry and, and business as a whole is that we come up with some great ideas but we don't have the ability to, uh, to commercialise them. I mean, in some respects you can talk about the internet with uh, Tim Berners-Lee producing probably the most important, <laughs> fundamentally the most important invention of the 20th century and it's the Americans that basically <laughs> took it away and, and commercialised it. Uh, with some of the biggest organisations in the world now. I think, I think we're, we are getting better at it because we're putting into place an infrastructure whereby um, innovators can access capital, they can grow things and do things. Um, but also they have to have a receptive audience to those innovations as well. People that are willing to take that risk uh, and to take things to the next level. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm totally, totally um, in love with innovation. So you mentioned the, you know, the United States is good. They, they picked up an idea and they ran with it. They ran with the internet idea and they developed it faster than anybody else. Do you think there's something intrinsic about that American approach to life I, I, that we perhaps could learn from? I think the most important thing is not having that fear of failure. Because inevitably, not everything is going to be successful. Mm. But you've got to do, you know, you may have to do 10 innovations in order to make the one that's going to make all the difference. But they, all the other ones lead to that one. So it uh, you know, can, can be a step, step change, um, but it, or it could be a brand new idea. It could be all sorts of different things. But you know, inevitably, if you, if you have that fear of failing, then you'll never do it. So what do you think? You've got to kiss a lot of frogs when you're being innovative, <laughs> haven't you? That's the truth. Yeah, I think Tony's made an excellent point there. I think there's something about the fact that the amount of innovation that comes out of America because of that point Tony made about failure. In, 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 for some reason, in, in our society, um, in the UK, failure in business, failure of an idea, is seen as something that you're not allowed to do. In America, you, you know, dust yourself up and you crack on. Permission yeah. to fail yeah. is an important part of innovation. So that, that, that makes me wonder there, Ed, about nature and nurture, I guess. <laughs> and in the context of this, is, innov is being innov innovative, is having innovative uh, approaches to whatever practice you're involved in, nature, nurture, is it a learned trait or is it something you're born with? I think for me, it has to be the, the former. Um, I, I don't... I, Innovation has to be planned, it has to be designed. It has to be, you have to make conscious decisions. You have to make um, a, a decision about doing something there and doing something at that time and doing something at another time or, or not. You know, those are conscious de decisions. The better planned you, you actually build um, your, your planning into the innovation and the design process of your product, your programs, your schemes, your, um, then the better chance of success. If, if, if we were all born with the innate ability to innovate, the world would be perfect, we'll have no problems. Set aside, mo set aside motivation and intent and, 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 and human will, you know, but we wouldn't have the problems that we have now. And, you know, and it's the ability for, for some people to, to identify that space where innovation can exist in, that makes the difference. Tony, are you a natural born innovator? Yes, absolutely 100%. Uh, I'm very fortunate in that respect. I think some people have actually um, compared it to vision. Uh, it's, a very it's a really interesting one because I, uh, I collaborate with my, my, my design director uh, at Panaz and we work together now for over 20 years and we have this ability to be able to communicate. We, we, just, we just know intrinsically um, I, I've got a particular role to play, she's got a particular role to play. Um, and, and it works really well. It's a bit like um, Elton John and Bernie Turpin. You know, I think you, know, you, you can't say that everybody could create you know, um, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road or, or whatever it is, um, because they can't. And, and I think that's exactly the same with, with innovation. I don't think everybody's born with it. I don't think everybody's born with that creative spark. But, it's, but, but a lot of people that have that creative spark can't take it any further. So, and, and, it's, and the same thing applies to music. You can get some great musicians that couldn't compose you know, a simple tune. They can play Shostakovich, but they can't create that little tune. So you know, it's a question of being able to utilize the skill, skill sets that you have and to channel it in a certain way that actually makes you create something new and innovative and, and different. So that's interesting. So I think, Tony, you describe yourself as a natural born innovator. Ed, you yeah. describe perhaps more something of a learned thing. I, I feel a little bit more like Ed, I think. 
that, that, uh, that I've had to learn how to fail, uh, learn how to accept things not going right. And then the better learning was embracing that and then moving forward, that, that's how we get things to change. That's, that's how I viewed it. But I wonder, Tony, when, do you get frustrated by others who aren't have been innovative around you? Or no, perhaps a different way of putting it, how do you inspire those around you to embrace innovation if they're not natural born innovators? Give people the tools. I think that, that's the thing. I mean, what, what, we, what we do at Panaz and what I try to encourage in all the businesses I'm involved in is to give people the tools to be able to communicate their innovations. So, for example, if you're working on the shop floor uh, and you, you, you have an idea, you've got, to be, have, you've got to have the facility to be able to take that somewhere uh, and make, put it into the system that actually gets looked at and, and, you know, and, and utilised in, in the future. If you have that, uh, that procedure, then it's a lot easier to innovate. And, and you, you choose to surround yourself in the work that you do, I think, um, forgive me if I'm making too, too far a bridge of an assumption here, but it strikes me that you surround yourself with innovative people. And I wonder how you manage those people in your world, and I wonder how you inspire them. Well, because of this, this sector that I operate in, the world I work in, with creative people from the creative industries and the cultural sectors, those people are, have the natural attributes to be innovators, but that's not what they do first and foremost. They are creatives, you know, and I never say I'm a creative, but I also think, you know, speaking to what Tony was just spoke about in terms of the design studio, you, you, you never talk about innovation without referencing the, the, the process of being a, a person who, who understands the tools of a creative practitioner. You know, that's, that's what you do, mm -hmm. and you're creating the conditions for innovation and, and for creativity to thrive in. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I, I go right the way back to when I was at Manchester University, which was a long time ago now. Uh, and uh, and the, 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 I was talking to, um, well, obviously one of, the, one of the professors on the course, um, her ambition was to make sure that all of us were on that course became directors of industry, <coughs> that, we, that we were able to influence at the highest level design. And, um, and, and I think most of us did. So that so through your university time, you had somebody to look at who mm -hmm. was pushing this idea when you were very young. So that person was trying to embed in you, I think, the idea that innovation is the right thing. This is how to lead is, is through innovation. A slight variation on my last question, really, but how do you embed the idea of innovative practice into an organisation? I mean, you grew your organisation up, but how, how do you embed it and bring new people in and this is the way we do things around here? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's because it becomes part of the culture. I mean, we, um, we have it embedded in our, in our organisation. It's all part of our DNA. Uh, and we get really upset when we're not coming up with new ideas. I mean, we're asking questions of ourselves. Why aren't we innovating? Why aren't we, what's wrong? You know, um, why, why can't we take that, design, that idea to the next level? I mean, we've got something we've been playing around with now for three years. And, uh, and we thought we had it, and, and we went to full-scale production, and, 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 and it fails. And, and, uh, but that's just the way it is. Um, I mean, some of the things, I mean, a couple of things I'll show you on, uh, on the slides later, um, you know, it originally failed, but you just keep trying and trying and trying. Tell you what, let's have a look at those slides, because we've got some really interesting ideas about Lancashire's historic, historical history of innovation, and there's some things on here which are kind of surprising. Tony. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'd, I'd just like to uh, start the, um, the slideshow with um, something that not a lot of people realise came out of Lancashire, uh, and I think that um, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the lads that might be watching this now will recognise Meccano, um, but not obviously knowing that it came, came out of Lancashire. So that's a great Lancashire innovation, still going now after, um, I don't know, 60, 70 years, which is... Quite, cre quite incredible. 123 years, Sorry, 123 years. I, know, I, I, I can't see from here, but <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> so, and then, of course, we've got Frank Whittle and the, the jet engine, um, which was developed at uh, Manchester University, Barnold's work in Clitheroe in, uh, during the war. I mean, that was, that was one of the most fundamental aspects that changed the war, as you know. So, I mean, an incredible thing, and, and something which has been fundamental to life in the 20th century. Can I just pause you there for a second, if, I'm, if I may? 
the idea that the jet engine idea, I think it, to me is that that concept of that what that's what feels like innovation. It's inventive. It's fresh. It's new. Okay, it was it modelled itself on a previous innovation, but it's that invention thing. And before we move to the next slide, I just challenge the idea. It's not just products that we're innovative with, is it? It's, there's, we have to be innovative with our people and with the way we process our businesses and our, our methodology. I wonder how far you go into that thinking. Well, I, I mean, inevitably, um, there's, there's even more slides actually that will show you that uh, we've, we've been innovative in, with regards to social change as well. Um, and, and of course, I, I've always said, I mean, m many years ago, um, uh, we, we ran a conference called Big Conference, which yeah. was the Business Innovation the Growth, growth. Oh. conference, which was a tremendous one. And, um, and, and one of the things that Ed and I agreed on from very the get-go from that was that every business, regard, regarding whether you're an accountancy firm, a law firm, uh, an IT firm, whatever it is, you've got, uh, you've got a, basically, you've got to innovate. You've got to innovate or terminate. Right, I'm not going to spoil your show again. <laughs> Tony, please carry on. The jet engine are fantastic. What have we got next? Well, then we've got um, some fantastic innovations uh, from British Aerospace, one of the jewels in the crown of Lancashire, of course. And this is the English electric lighting, uh, lightning, sorry, not lighting, electric lightning uh, plane that was developed at British Aerospace um, and was first built in, in Lancashire in, in uh, 1953. And was in service until uh, nineteen. Sorry, until nineteen eighty-eight. Is that so? It's quite, quite, quite incredible, really. It, it is quite remarkable. You, I mean, looking at the picture now, and you think, "Wow, that was designed 50, 60 years ago." Mm. That was designed before we had pocket calculators. Yeah, um, it, it's quite astounding. That's probably Salisbury in the background, yeah. actually. Um, and then we have something like this, which is brand new technology. When I when I contacted uh, British Aerospace, by the way, I told them that. Um, we can't breach any of the official secrets acts in terms of some of the innovations that they've come out with. But this is something very, very new, um, which is a bit like a stealth uh, bomber, as you can see. Um, and uh, but utilizing air to make things happen within the airplane. So it's, that's a very new in, uh, innovation, which has been developed with Manchester University. Um, and then superplastic forming and diff diffusion uh, bonding. Uh, this is this is uh, a new. Um, piece of technology which has again been brought, um, been brought together by British Aerospace in order to make things lighter um, and um, you know utilizing new materials um, quite quite fascinating um, and I'm sure that anybody interested in that could uh, could you know get in contact with British Aerospace and talk to them about it because uh, they're quite happy to share some of their I IP. Well I think that idea of, of sharing you know knowledge transfer between yeah. sectors is something we need to embrace. Very much so. Official Secrets Act apart. Yeah. So this is a bit of a history lesson as well. Um, this is um, uh, a, an innovation that came out of Blackburn uh, from Promethean, uh, which was founded by your good friend, uh, Tony Cam, uh, in uh, 1996. Yep. Uh, and um, it's obviously ubiquitous now in schools, um, utilised everywhere for, uh, instead, of, uh, instead of blackboards, Quite, quite an amazing story. Uh, an incredible product which, which really changed the world of ed education and mm. the, you know, the, the next stage of Tony Cannon's iteration of this product is, is more software based, it's learning rather, rather than the tools of learning, it's the actual learning itself. But I think absolutely fascinating and, and can you imagine uh, an environment now where this Blackburn invention wasn't in play? But also the term whiteboard didn't exist until Promethean <laughs> and, and entered that space. And now, and, now, and now you have virtual whiteboards. Yeah, so it became so, part of the English language. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, then we have Perspex. I can see right through you. <laughs> Perspex was uh, developed uh, in Darwin. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's still used now, as you know. It's um, a major, as, as a major component for so many different things. And the now Jelly we're Baby. Talking. <laughs> I, I tweeted this out actually a couple of weeks ago because I was when I was doing my research, and and a friend of mine uh, sent me a text back saying that's why I eat jelly babies, my favourite sweet because it was made in Lancashire, so and that's where it was developed. I think we need to just just pause for a second there and just just, just remind ourselves of how times have changed because jelly babies were originally going to be called unclaimed babies. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, <laughs> a Victorian era for you there, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. 
Um, and then, of course, uh, a family favourite, uh, Vimto. Um, we've had a bit of a conversation about that this morning <laughs> because I've actually said it was founded in Granby Row in, uh, in the centre of Manchester. And that's my old university in uh, Sackville Street. And I remember that uh, Vimto bottle going up. It was a long, long time ago. Um, so it must have been there, Richard, because where you said it was made, there is no Vimto bottle. No, you're absolutely right. But ladies and gentlemen, I ch my challenge is, and I reckon Vimto was invented on Duke's Brown in Blackburn, but we'll, we'll, we'll save that for another day. So you were you missed then? That was a you missed building. That's time, the you missed built building. I, in, I in think Sackville we went Street. to the same university. It's a fantastic university, um, very similar to um, some of the great technology universities in the world, like MIT. Absolutely. And then, of course, this is what we were talking about earlier about social um, innovation. And of course, um, Emmeline Pankhurst was a, a very famous Lancastrian who spearheaded the, um, the, the rights for women to have votes. Um, but it's a great, uh, great thing, great example of, um, of social change. But what it was, and, the, and again, let's just cast our minds back and our minds forward to the, today's, the, the suffragettes would find it quite difficult protesting right now, wouldn't they? Well, I think I think it's very interesting, actually. What the the new law that's been um, uh, the, the Conservatives have brought in. I, I'm actually very dubious about it. Actually, very yes. frightening. Yes, I remember something similar coming in the eighties, the police bill. But it, um, yeah. nonetheless, yeah, thank you. So this idea of it's social change is not just about products; it's about people and, this, yeah. and, and politics, of course. Absolutely right. Yeah. Thank you. So um, yeah, I mean, an, an amazing, amazing thing, an amazing woman. Um, and of course, what my house is made out of, Accrington brick. Incredibly strong, um, you know, you try to drill through it. It's, it's almost impossible. I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't like to count how many drill bits I've destroyed by trying to drill through an Accrington brick. In fact, you have to find the mortar in between to actually create the hole. It's very difficult to drill. Mm -hmm. This is, I mean, it is incredible stuff. You, you've, you can see it in Blackpool Tower, but there's the Empire State Building story that I think we all love, isn't it? That, mm -hmm. that literally it's built from the ground up. The foundation of the Empire yeah. State Building. That's, that, it's incredible. So all the way from Accrington. Um, and the word dinosaur came from Lancashire. No, heavens, of course. Mm. Yep, from uh, a paleontologist. See, it's all the P's. People, yep. processes, products, paleontologists, Paleontology. politics, the law. Yeah. Um, when he was a pupil at uh, pupils, you know, <laughs> anyway, Lancaster, Lancaster Royal Grammar School. Um, so yeah, that's something which I, I certainly never knew. Of course, we have the spinning jenny and uh, Compton's mule, which revolutionised the, the textile industry. But that's going back a long time. And I just thought I'd mention something, a few things about the textile industry because that's my industry. Um, and I wonder whether people realise that polyester. Um, was actually developed also in um, in, in, in Lancashire. Um, in, um, it was actually Calico Printers Association, which actually then went on to be called Tootle, um, that developed it. I didn't know that. As an offshoot, actually, of, of nylon. And, and probably polyester now is the most widely used um, thread uh, or polymer in, in the world, because, of course, it's also used for the creation of sheets as well, all sorts of different things. It's a product you use in your business? We use it enormously because we, use, we, we, were, we were one of the companies that were first to use the um, modified polyester which contained um, flame retardant chemistry to make it inherently flame retardant. So that's, a, that's an incredibly versatile um, fibre. Um, and then we got Panaz here. We, um, we P won again. a P, another P. We won the Queen's Award um, for a product that we developed called Shield Plus, um, which is an antimicrobial um, fabric which kills viruses and, um, and bacteria on, on contact. Um, it's also waterproof, it's also flame retardant, it's washable, and, it, and we create beautiful fabrics out of it. Um, and, and that took years to develop. But we developed it originally for use in hospitals to combat hospital-acquired infection. Um, and um, so it was, it was something that we, that we created to answer or provide a solution to a major problem that we were having then. What we didn't know, of course, is that it would go on to kill the coronavirus as well. So it's also a surface that you can utilise that will prevent the spread of the coronavirus. Uh, and then going on to another company that I'm involved in, which is Elucid, 
which is uh, a company, an incredibly innovative company, which is a spin out from the University of Central Lancashire. And um, that takes old glass from old uh, TV sets and TV, computer screens and, and bottles and, um, and mixes it with, um, with uh, ceramic, uh, broken ceramics from the ceramics industry um, and waste ceramics. Um, and we create some great products out of it. First of all, could you just tell us some of the products that are made from it? But then I want to just come back on a question. What products yeah. are out there that contain this? Well, um, it was a brand new innov innovation that was created by um, David Binns and Alistair Bremner, um, who um, were, um, they were, they were both uh, working in the ceramics department at um, uh, UCLan. Uh, and they, they, in answer to a, um, a competition, a European competition, to create products out of waste, they came up with this concept. And I, I got involved with it in it about five years ago. They asked me to become chairman of the company uh, in order to try to steer it towards um, fund, uh, fund generation to, to get the thing up and running and, of course, also to, uh, to find products and to find customers for it. Um, we, we've, we're now just completing our first uh, scale-up in a, in a, in a, in a uh, manufacturing uh, arena and producing our first tiles for Topps Tiles um, who are going to release it uh, nationwide. So it's, it's an amazing product made out of waste that would have gone into the waste stream. And the bit, the bit I'm intrigued by, as, as a non-inventor or a non-product mm. inventor, what, where, where did this spark, what, what was the innovative spark that led to mixing Old, old useless ceramic and old useless yeah. glass to create new wonderful products. Yeah, well, it was it was in response to the European initiative to uh, to generate products out of waste, and and they came up with the idea. Talking to well, obviously talking about the whole the whole program, it was also sponsored by the European Union um, in terms of the development of it. So um, it was it was terrific. I mean, but it's taken us five years to go from the lab. To where we are now, so you know, trial and error, trialing, trialing, doing things. You know, we're, we're completely obsessed with it in terms of we know it's going to work, but it's taken a long time. Um, we have patents, but also we have also built up a huge amount of know-how in the business. But you know, that, it's that old thing. You just have to keep trying all the time. It doesn't always work no, the first time. It's not. It's not. <laughs> and then you, you, the uses for this product you haven't even worked out yet. It'll, well, it'll come down the line. Well, we're, we're, we're producing. We've we've done now. We've produced tabletops for Pret a Manger in uh, in London. Um, we do. We had a great one recently where um, Nando's asked us to recycle their ceramic ware. Uh, you know, all of their plates and crockery and everything, and to put it into tiles that they were going to use in their new builds. Thank you. I remember when you launched it at uh, London at. Um, one hundred percent design. Yeah, with, and yeah. I remember speaking to David about it, and you had an inquiry about the acoustic qualities. If you look yeah. at it, you think about what you see in studios. It's 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 interesting the capabilities of what it could do. A conversation well. with AMS Neve, maybe they're just up the road. They might be able to tell you that one. There's a good. There's innovation. Ten <laughs> percent. So I mean, I just also want to dispel some of the myths that uh, that Lancashire actually invented some of these products as well. So, so tide tables, I mean, these, these are part of my research. So tide tables, no, we didn't invent tide tables, even though we could have done in Fleetwood, but we didn't. The torpedo, goodness knows where that came from, but that's actually a German invasion. Invasion. Aust Austrian, Austrian, actually. Um, and then the kilt, goodness knows who thought we could have invented the kilt. Uh, pasta. Oswald was... Twistle, everybody knows pasta came from Oswald Twistle. <laughs> pasta. Pasta. I mean, I don't know. Anyway, somebody obviously thought it was a good idea. Um, the railway. Now, I think they probably actually had something to do with it, but I don't think we actually completely invented it. Now, the pyramids, that was stretching it a bit too far, really. I know we love Lancashire, but we can, and we can claim to a lot of things, but not the pyramids. Treacle mines. Now, I don't know, you might want to argue about that one. Well, I might. Well, 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 give me your perspective and I'll give you mine. I haven't got any perspective on it, Richard. <laughs> well, treacle, treacle mines, the, 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 the treacle mines as we knew them, the playful treacle mines of Sabden were based on the idea of we had very, very, Lancashire was the home to coal, but very poor quality coal, and Don Moores was, is, is a place for that. And it was called treacle, uh, treacle coal, it was treacly in its, in its texture, it wasn't firm, it was immature coal, that's why that's it was called treacle. Ah, yeah, but I'm not sure if it's... 
I'm sure it exists elsewhere as well. Okay, just to go on then. So the cooperative movement, I was always of the impression it was actually created in, in Rochdale. That is not the case. It was actually, uh, I, think, I think there could be a number of places that could have um, but claimed isn't Watchdale just historic Lancashire? Uh, uh, we'll have it in Lancashire uh, today. Yeah, well, no, I mean, to me, it was in Lancashire when it was, you know. Uh, and um, communism, um, not, really, not really, not really. But anyway, so those were a few Mark things. Marks and Engels rode together in Manchester, not quite the same and, thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think there's something interesting about that, even though it's quite flippant as well, and quite, you know, there's a serious point about the fact that you made a point that manufacturing industry, you know, what things that you do are big stories in Lancashire. Mm. So all of this stuff here was actually appropriated, a lot of that stuff there in, in Lancashire, you know, through our industries, you know, and that speaks to this whole idea about it's how you appropriate a, an, an idea or creativity that actually, that's where the innovation. So, you know, you, you could almost argue that Lancashire has an, an innovation story beyond the things that we necessarily are offered here. Well, that, that's a good lead into a question from the audience, if I may. This is from uh, one of our attendees. Um, this is how the question rolls out. You mentioned the USA took the internet and ran with it due to, to, to be potential reticence at uh, British side. Do you think we've overcome our reticence? You, you talk about appropriation. I wonder if, if um, we're just a little bit reticent. I think it happens here, it may, but it may happen in some un, un, unusual spaces. Um, if you think about a, a project like Art in Manufacturing, that's part of the Na National Festival of Making, yes. where we, which Tony's and Penaz are being part of, where you combine a manufacturer in Lancashire with an artist from anywhere in the country, or the world, I guess, actually. Yeah. And the outcomes are not, they're not necessarily presumed, or they're not necessarily predetermined what's going to happen. There's going to be some, some kind of intervention there. And there is the risk that the artist may disrupt the manufacturing process. But actually, what, what tends to happen in the artistic and the creative space is that you're pushing the boundaries of capabilities of material. Exactly what Tony's doing with, with, with Lucid yeah. as well. So some of the ideas that, have, that take place in that artistic space Often, t often appropriated into industrial and manufacturing processes and, mater and materials. Okay. So, and, and sometimes I don't think we tell that story very well. So y yes, it's happening. It's happening all the time. Mm -hmm. There's also another story about what you talked before about failure and why maybe some um, innovators have to feel they have to go away maybe to, to develop their ideas and their products to see their, to see their opportunity maximised. Mm, totally. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure. I think, I think one, one of the things I would like to say in relation to the question is that um, if you read the book on, about Google and how Google was actually created, uh, and indeed some of the other great internet stories, they were never created originally as revenue generators. Mm -hmm. They were created as ideas. And it was only afterwards, it was like, well, how can we monetize this idea? Mm. Um, mm. You know, because there was, we need to have it, it's got to be sustainable. So how do we monetize it? So, and, and, but they were still getting um, investment at that early stage, seed investment. People believed in the idea, um, but that doesn't happen as much here. I mean, certainly, you know, with regards to Elucid, Elucid, I believe, has got world-class world technology in what it's doing. Um, I think it's doing absolutely the right thing in utilizing waste streams to create beautiful products. Um, but, you know, we, we still have to fight to generate um, the, the revenue, that, not revenue, sorry, the investment that we need to take the company to the next level. Sure. You know, but I it's don't not think easy. That's, I don't think that um, innovation, you know, good innovation has to take place within that industrial or that commercial paradigm. It can, it can take place, like, like you say, it can be a, a, a social or, or political movement. Mm. It can be a movement for change. It can be something that has good at inherently at the heart of it, where, again, you don't have a, a set idea about what the return on investment is going to be, if any at all. You know, yeah. for, for me, that's where innovation gets really interesting, really. Yeah. You know, and maybe that's, some people, some people call that social innovation, maybe, as well. You know, but that's an interesting, um, you know, part, part of our innovation story as well. Yeah, yeah. Tony, we 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 we, uh, we, we took you to that that slide. Are, are the, are the further slides and uh, no, well, I th basically, innovation never stops. Never sleeps. Never stops. Uh, never never, never sleeps. sleeps. Um, I've got another question here um, from our audience. Is there one thing, gentlemen, 
from the past which made the rest of the world sit up and take notice with what Lancashire was doing. Ed, is there one particular thing that stands out to you? Oh, God. Um, well, if everyone will talk about one of the examples that Tony highlighted, you know, the spinning jenny. You know, the, the textile story of Lancashire was, was transformative to the whole world. You know, it brought Gandhi to Blackburn. That's one of the stories that we're telling mm -hmm. in, in the British Textile Biennial that's running now until the end of the month. Um, the, the exhibition by um, Barty Palmer at Blackburn Museum. Um, you know, so I, I, I think for me that could be the one. Um, however, you know, there's other things that we do in Lancashire that are really interesting. Like, flippantly, when I, when I first came here, I was always told that one of our key assets and stories was the KFC story. The first, the first KFC, you know, the county of first sort of thing. Because the first KFC was in, in Preston. Indeed. You know, it was test place. And there's something about the, the, the demographic of Preston and the, the size of place and the demographic, which makes it a great place to actually test an idea and a product. So that's why companies historically have actually come to the UK, you know, to actually launch products to, to test the market in here as well. So. I think it's, it's not really an innovation, but it's part of an innovation story because it's, it's introducing new things to a new territory into it in, in, in new ways. Thanks, Ed. I've got another question here. Um, was, this is from an anonymous attendee. Was Liverpool to Manchester not the first steam-powered passenger carrying intercity <laughs> railway in the world? Well, we're going to set that for you for your homework, so we'd like you to come back with the answer <laughs> next week. In the meantime, Tony, um, is, there some, is there a standout idea, a concept um, for you? I mean, you've given us a great list there. Did you reject any that you, that you didn't quite want to bring to the table? Um, no, I don't think so. I think, the, um, I think, I think Ed really um, sort of encapsulated all, the, one of the most important aspects was mass production. Um, and I think to be able to take a concept and then scale it up obviously was, was intrinsic to the textile industry and, and, uh, and what it did in those days. Uh, well, you, Ed, let's, let's, I think we're, we're coming towards the, the conclusion of this, this session, Ed. Um, I wonder what examples of innovation have inspired you or is there something that would inspire you? I think what's, again, I'm, I'm going to stick a bit to textiles here, but I think it's really interesting what's happening in terms of material and in terms of how we can look at some of the problems, some of the challenges that we have to deal with now as a society. You know, when you think about climate action and, and about the, the jet engine, okay, that's a great innovation of, of the time, but now it's a problem. It's a problem. Yes. And, and when you think about the fact now that within a, a new jetliner, there is actually more textile than there is metal because it's lighter. And, and it's the innovation that's taken place, and I will mean real innovation in terms of how science and technology has actually developed into technical textiles, which Tony's part of that story with Penaz, with their polyester as well. Mm. You know, I think, and, and everybody's got a textile story. Textile has, you know, it's been, it's been around longer than any polymer, than any, than any, than any kind of composite material. There's, there's always been a textile, whether it's a skin textile or something. Mm. So it's, it's an ongoing evolutionary story, really. And I think the possibilities, you know, for, for textile and the innovation in the technical textile space is really, really interesting going forward. Thank you. Tony, what's inspired you in the world of innovation? Well, I'm thinking there must be something well, in your life or you read or you saw, you spoke to that made, made, made you think, I get it now. I think I think what I'd like to to I, I can say yes there has been but it's been a lifetime of innovation a lifetime of innovation a lifetime of reading about ideas a lifetime of looking and seeing what people have done and one one of the things that really has inspired me to 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 really push Lancashire into city of culture is, is to actually create infrastructures so I mean us, us Lancashire um, the, the first idea of us actually creating a virtual city of Lancashire was incredibly innovative in its, in its, it, it, at the start. Um, and what we, what we said to ourselves was, you know, why, why is it that now cities have to be, um, have boundaries um, that were formed hundreds of years ago or that were created because of natural things like rivers and, and, uh, and other natural boundaries? We don't need to. What, you know, uh, cities can be created uh, as, as communities. 
um, and they can be digitally connected as well as anywhere else. So that's why we started to come up with this new idea, this new concept of Lancashire being something you know, far bigger than, than a number of different things. And once you get everybody joining together, you know, the, the, the whole becomes greater than the parts. And I think that um, you know, Lancashire can achieve a great deal if it comes to, together and, and, uh, and really d does these, uh, these, these, these great things. Okay. Well, Ed, sorry, well, please. I would say just on, on that as well, but on that, I mean, t city of, uh, our vision for City of Culture is very much about creating the conditions and the space where innovation can take a place. Absolutely. We're, we're looking at how we're going to address those challenges mm. like climate ch change, you know, with, you know, the problems caused with engine. How are cities going to respond to those challenges in the future? How are we going to respond to challenges on the coast of, 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 of a rising coastline? How are we going to address the, the, the transformation in what we do for live, work and play? You know, all of that stuff is going to be contained and addressed through a creative program. With all that in mind, Ed, Tony, with all that in mind, let's imagine a scenario, ladies and gentlemen, maybe 100, 150 years from now, there's a hologram of Richard sitting in a hologram of this nice pink chair, there's a hologram of Ed sitting mm. over there, there's a hologram of Tony sitting over there, and when our holograms and our artificial intelligence comes back to this conversation in 150 years time, what will we look back at and say, those were the things that created the environment for the innovators to flourish. What do we do? You, you touched on something there, Richard, which um, is something that everybody should be conscious of, and that's artificial intelligence. Um, it's, I, I think it's incredibly scary. And I think that unless we actually create the right infrastructures and put the right, the right things in place, then um, a bit like climate change, it will creep up on us very quickly. Uh, and before you know it, there's no way back. And, uh, you know, it's already happening now. Um, you know, it, you know it, it, it's really interesting what the government is talking about now, isn't it, about upskilling the, the workforce, which I think is a really, really important thing. Um, I still need somebody it, to flip burgers. It, it, you do, but, well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. You'll just have a robot doing <laughs> yeah. it. But, yeah. you know, it, it, we do need this upskilling um, because it's going to become, you know, the world is going to become even more competitive as we go forward. Ed, what do you think? City of Culture aside, because we, we're going to find out in the next few days uh, where we live with the City of Culture. So just that to one side, how do we create the environment for, for innovators to flourish? I don't think it's been fair for tech, tech, tech's at all. And yes, there is that danger that we're going to sleepwalk into some kind of disaster as, as well. Mm. But tech is an, en tech's an enabler. You know, it's, it's humans and it's humans in creativity, it's humans intent and will to determine how we are going to utilise these great tools and these great assets that we have now. And, and we don't even have the language yet, Richard, to, to even talk about what we're going to be looking like when we're holograms or even in four, four years time we come to the, the next UK city of culture. The, the language, it doesn't exist yet. For what we, you know, for, for, for the jobs we're going to be doing, you know, for the verbs that are going to be created. So, I mean, but what we have to do is, is not be fearful, but be, but, but go into it consciously. Ed Matthews Gentle, Tony Attard, on behalf of all those who've tuned in this afternoon and those who are watching on, on demand. Uh, well, those on demand, you'll know how we got on with the City of Culture. Perhaps you'll be watching this in 150 years' time as well, on demand through artificial intelligence. That would be a nice thought. In the meantime, um, on behalf of the Lancashire Innovation Festival, this has been Lancashire's Innovation History. My name is Richard Slater and will be in 150 years' time. And the publisher of Lancashire Business View magazine will be reporting on this soon. In the meantime, thanks ever so much for joining us. <laughs>